to the Built on Air podcast, the variety show for all things Airtable. Each episode, we cover four different segments. It's always fresh and different and lots of fun while you get the insider info on all things Airtable. Our hosts and guests are some of the most senior experts in the Airtable community. Join us live each week on our YouTube channel every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And join our active community at builtonair.com slash join. Before we begin, a word from our sponsor, OntoAir.com. Any business running on Airtable gets the value that Airtable has, but also needs a few more functions to complete their operations. That's where OntoAir comes in. It's a suite of tools for any business running on Airtable to maximize your operations efficiencies and automations. One customer, John, states that OntoAir enables his business to function properly without having to think about building their own software, and that is pretty invaluable. The OntoAir Airtable apps are amazing, and we use them often and are very happy with the results. So join John and hundreds more customers and take your Airtable to the next level with OntoAir. Sign up today with promo code BUILTONAIR for a 10% discount. Check them out at OntoAir.com. And now let's check out today's episode and see what we built on air. Welcome everyone to the Built on Air podcast. Good to be with you today after a week off. We're well rested and ready to go. Everybody have a good week off. Ali and Camille are with us today. So good to, good to be with you. I'm Dan and we'll be hosting your show for today. As always, the Built on Air podcast is a live show where we go through and talk about everything happening in the world of Airtable and bring you the latest news and insights and tips on how to improve your Airtable environment and and working with Airtable. So we're good to be with you today and let's get started. As always, we start our show with the Round the Basis segment where we'll go through the different Airtable communities and see what's going on and learn about the latest discussions of everything in in Airtable. So I thought we'd start off. We had a end of month since last time we discussed. And with that usually comes a list of new features from Airtable. So going through the what's new um, section with uh, June updates, um, any big ones that you guys like that they released in June? Well, um, there were a couple of things. There were some changes to, uh, the scheduled automations feature, um, that I thought were good. The before, I think you could only do it every minute or every hour. And now you can do it every minute, hour or week. Um, so that's I'm actually nice. gonna I'm gonna show that in the automate create, so we'll dive into that. Great. Um, and there was like uh, the Google Drive sync. Um, it's a beta, but a beta, uh, yeah. yeah, that was this month as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that'll be for for pro users, so that's good. Um, Salesforce, it looks like is open, but it's still enterprise. Maybe someday they'll give Salesforce to the rest of us. But for now, it's still enterprise. Um, The add record button, if you notice that, now there's a permanent add record button. Um, See, it's not on sync tables. There it is. So that plus button down there is now always there. So that's after some good pushback from the community, I believe. (laughs) You're familiar with that that dialogue, so that was good to see added. Mm -hmm. Uh, This section is now collapsible, the the create view section. So if you go to create a view, this right here, you can now hide that. That was like always there, taken up prime real estate when you may not need that. So that's a big, that's a big uh, space saver. Yeah. There's the one I found this morning that's not on that list. That is, um, you can now add views to your favorites, which is super cool. Yeah, let me, let me show that. So talk through that. 
Yeah, if you can, you, while you're mousing over the view that you're on, you can, it'll show you that little star and you can add it um, by just clicking right there or that one was already added so that, that'll remove it. But then you can also just click on the little drop down on the right hand side and add it to your favorites. And I'm, you know, I'm 99% sure that that's user specific. I have not verified that, but it would be kind of silly if it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so cool uh, feature now they have ad favorites. So you saw it here first. Uh, I don't believe they've announced this feature yet. And um, it's only on pro, it's only on pro bases, which makes sense since it's kind of creating um, sections, which is also only available on pro. So that's a cool favorite section that'll come in handy. Definitely. Um, this other one that I've seen other people kind of running into this on running a script, there's, it now gives you a warning of a memory limit of six megabytes. Um, somebody in our Slack community has already run into that. And I don't know if that was always there and now they just, they say they just make it a, a more specific error message. So maybe before it was giving an error message of timing out or something. And now there's a specific error message that, that you're uh, using up too much memory. So I haven't run into that yet, but I imagine I will. Um, especially if you're loading in a lot of records, uh, that, that seems like a small limit. So I'm kind of disappointed to see that. <laughs> so we'll see if that becomes an issue. <clears throat> Um, copy automation URL. Um, so you can go directly to an automation. <laughs> I don't know how many people were asking for that, but that could maybe be useful. I think it's more to help their support team, I think. Yeah. Because if, if something's going wrong with an automation, um, just getting to the thing that's causing the error, um, yeah, I don't, from a user standpoint, I don't think it's uh, gonna come up super often that we're gonna need the link. Yeah, interesting. This one's interesting. This is more, I think, kind of a, a, a bug fix where if you're using the find records task within an automation, I guess they were coming in in a different order than the view. Um, and so now you can specify the view that you're fine. Well, you could always specify the view, but now it will, the ordering will stay the same. So that is useful. And it looks like some mobile updates. So um, improvements on the mobile apps, which is always good. Um, interesting. So now you can add a, the flashlight on the barcode scanner to help scan your barcode. So that's cool. All right, so those are those are the updates for uh, for the month of June, plus some new ones that are just out today. So check those out, play with those features. Let us know what you think of of uh, anything that they added in June. Love to hear it. So let's move on. I picked a couple articles or a couple posts on people um, talking about different um, issues that they're facing that I thought would be good to to discuss. Camille, here's one that looks like you answered or mm -hmm. helped answer. Um, so it's about um, getting using the, the substitute formula and um, how that works. Yeah, they had a, a text field that was coming in from the data they were importing and things were separated with a semicolon instead of a comma. And they were trying to convert that into a multi-select field. If you do it right away, it'll just make one really long single option because it needs to be separated by a comma. And so it was just a matter of using a formula field to substitute all the semicolons with commas and then converting the formula field into the multi-select field and then either deleting or hiding the original field. Um, the uh, last couple of comments in this thread is just, they're a little bit confused about trying to convert the original fields from the get-go. You can't, you have to add a new field first, make that the formula, do the substitute, then convert it. Um, 
and then that's it. Problem yeah. solved. I think I think one thing that that I that caught my attention was how they were getting a circular reference. And mm -hmm. I thought that might be good to talk about. Do you want to explain what yeah. that circular reference is? So they had the original column that had the semicolons in it, and they were uh, converting that into a formula and saying, replace everything in the field semicolon uh, with uh, a comma. But that's a circular reference because the formula field cannot reference itself. Um, you would have a endlessly recursive formula. And so that's, you know going to eat up all of Airtable's com computing power, if you will. So uh, you can't have a formula field reference itself, and you can't have formulas that uh, both rely on each other. You can have a formula, you know, calculate one thing and another formula come in after that and calculate based on that. But you can't have A calculate B and B calculate A. That doesn't make sense. Right. Um, so that was how they ended up getting a circular reference here. And so we just clarified that, no, you actually need a separate field um, uh, for the formula so it can look at the original without referencing itself. Yeah, very good. Yeah, you'll see this. Sometimes you could have fields, you know, formulas referencing formulas, referencing formulas, and then you want to reference the original formula and you're like three deep and not realizing that that you created a circular reference. So luckily they give you a warning there. I find that that can happen really often when you're using a formula field for your primary key, like for the ID field of each record. Mm -hmm. Like even when you're uh, like three tables away, it can still give you that reference and then you got to back up and be like, wait, but. Yeah, 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 I could see that. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So you got to be careful there. All right, next one. Um, <clears throat> so general, um, this was a question on kind of strategy of your workflows of having one base where you kind of keep everything and then and then um, be able to use that base as kind of your primary source. All three of us remember days prior to table syncing features being added to Airtable where you had to come up with some workarounds to try to get your data from one base to another. That has become easier now with Airtable Sync, but as Justin points out, you do need to be careful of, um, or actually Databaser points out, 20 sync tables into one base is the limit. Mm -hmm. So you need to be careful if that becomes an issue of having lots of bases going into one or one base going into um now so it's 20 into one but one can go to more than 20 is that correct correct yeah. you can have one table synced into as many different bases as you want one table can only accept three sources so you can only combine three tables into one table i think they and updated then, that yesterday oh they did Literally yesterday, I tried for the very first time, I tried to sync multiple sources into one table and I got to three and I was like, well, that's all we can do. And then it was like, new, add another source. Huh. Like literally just yesterday, I saw this. Oh, um, cool. But, and that was also Sweet. the first time I ever tried it and it was really cool. It was way more flexible than I ever thought it would be. Do yeah. we know what the new limit is? No, not yet. <laughs> well, I'm going to assume five. <laughs> Probably a good guess. Yeah, if anybody out there knows what the new limit or wants to play with that, we could we can maybe try that for a future one. That's good to know. Yeah. So they yeah. must uh, be increasing those limits, which is always a good thing. Do so would that so towards that 20 tables, would that would would a multiple source table just count as one or would it count? I the think. OK, I think it counts as one table. I would hope so. I mean, it does say 20 tables. Yeah. They're not 20 sync sources. So that would be cool. Hmm. Ooh, I also, this is kind of a side note, sidebar. I noticed the other day that you can now import to an existing table a CSV file. Without like, the app? Yeah. Oh, yay. So that's pretty cool. So that's through... Well, she's saying the existing table. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, that's exciting. Wow. Oh, isn't that the app? It just the adds the oh, but it does bring the app up. Okay. It basically is a shortcut to the app. Well, that's silly. <laughs> but that's better than that's helpful. Yeah, yeah I, I, it's it's helpful to I guess consolidate all the import options. Um, I do wonder how many of the apps over time are going to be moved into the uh, regular Airtable UI because it's it's not like they don't gate pro features like sync set uh, not sync sections view sections are a pro feature and you know you, you just can't add a section if you're not pro. So I'm wondering if they're going to take the CSV import app and put it into the regular UI without it opening up the app bar, um, like a Gantt moving into its own view type. Right. Yeah. Hopefully that would open up some doors. Yeah. Very good. <clears throat> okay. One more um, from the air table. Well, actually there's one more after this, but this one I thought was interesting. Somebody asked, is there a way to track all of your SMS text messages? So they're already using the SMS app in Airtable um, with Twilio, but as they point out, there isn't a way, it doesn't keep track of all the text messages that you send. So they're saying, man, it would be nice to track all of those in an Airtable table um, so you can see a history of all your text messages. Well, sure enough, our friend Scott links to our episode where he does exactly that. So I thought that was pretty cool that uh, we were helping solve a very specific use case that somebody needed. So if you also need that, check out our previous episode. It looks like it was episode six um, where Scott came on and and showed a pretty impressive um, uh, mini app that he built that is all SMS based and can track all your text messages back and forth with people and your history and everything. So very cool to see that. Okay. Final question. Um, I thought this one was cool. We've also talked about the, uh, web clipper and in a previous episode, we showed that app, a uh, very powerful app. And this person is trying to, within LinkedIn, extract this one specific number. And Camille, why don't you share how you helped them solve this? Well, they were kind enough to include screenshots of the developer console, um, which will show the HTML structure of every page. And so uh, right there in the screenshot, uh, you can see that it has a series of different classes associated with it and classes in CSS just apply different styling rules. So um, I just used, you know, context clues to figure out which one of those classes was the most important. You could include all of them if you wanted. Um, I just picked the one that seemed to make the most sense and it was called like SSI underscore underscore score. Um, and that's the value that they were trying to extract. So what you would do is in the Web Clipper app, you would in CSS notation, which is dot, if it's a class, and then the name of the class. If you're looking at the ID of an HTML element, it would be um, hashtag or uh, pound sign, and then the name. Um, there's a couple of different uh, things you have to follow if you're trying to include more than one class or more than one HTML element um, or anything else like that, but it all follows regular CSS styling rules. So if it's the same element that has two classes applied, you would concatenate the two names of the class together with no space. If it's a nested element, like inside of a div, there's an H1, you would include the class of the H1 of the div space and then the class of the H1 inside of it. But that's regular CSS. And if you need um, a little bit of um, coaching on how to do that, uh, Airtable has a support article for that. And CSS is like one of the most common languages on the planet. So you can look up literally anywhere and they'll tell you how to do it. Yep. Yeah, and sometimes it gets tricky because there's more than one value that it could that it could pull from. So you mm -hmm. might need to get more specific, but it looks like this one was pretty straightforward. So 
one of the powerful i really like um that feature within within the uh web clipper definitely comes in handy for pulling data out of out of out of websites and pushing into Airtable. So with that, let's move on to our own built on air Slack community. So we have a pretty active community of people helping each other, talking about other stuff that they're working on, finding help. So join us, builtonair.com slash join, <clears throat> and you can join in on, on the discussion. So <clears throat> this one I thought was interesting. Somebody looking for an unsubscribe feature where maybe you're almost building like a CRM out of Airtable and you need to legally you need to have if you're if you're marketing and sending emails to people a way for people to unsubscribe for um, future um, email notifications and so think you know any major system mailchimp or whatever is going to have that functionality so if you're trying to build that functionality within airtable airtable's emails don't uh have that feature um <clears throat> Cause you're kind of in control of your users. And so if you're sending emails, one, you shouldn't be spent sending a ton of um, marketing related email, but if this is to kind of a smaller known universe of, of people that you're sending to, you might need to add a link. Um, any, any thoughts on how you could potentially do that with, with their table? It's not pretty. Yeah. Uh, one of the problems is a lot of times people will say, I want to send an email to everyone who is currently, you know, subscribing to this product, but they don't have a separate table or list of like mailing lists, like a traditional marketing uh, team would have. And so it's easy to unsubscribe somebody from a mailing list. If you have like this person said they want, a bunch of emails now they said that they don't versus someone who is just a customer that i have you know it's it would it if you don't have that kind of setup it's kind of hard to engineer a unsubscribe feature because what are they unsubscribing to everything or just that one type of email that you just sent right i would um uh, i mean you i think you could definitely do it natively but i like Camille said, it's definitely not going to be pretty. Like you'd probably have to use just an Airtable form and then like force somebody to pick an unsubscribe, like from just one option in the single select and then submit. But if it were me, I'd probably, I've been getting into the habit of doing um, like auto submitted mini extension forms that just redirect you to another mini extensions, like public share link for a record. So it's kind of like a form that edits the existing record and then lands you on a landing page showing you, okay, yep, you did it. Um, but it is a little slow. Yeah. Yeah. On a similar vein, I was thinking, could you send them to a automation webhook URL, mm -hmm. but those have to be, do those have to be a post? I haven't been able to get it work to work by just clicking on it. An Airtable webhook. Yeah, an Airtable. I think those have to be a post, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so it this is kind of technical, but if you just click on a link, that's called a get request, um, and you can't actually perform a post directly through like the browser, um, you know, URL address. So that may not work. Um, the other challenge is if you're doing this with email, you have to be careful even like the approach you talked about because email systems when they're looking for spam some will actually click through links within the email to verify that where they're taking you is a valid you know website that's that's legit right. and so if it's just purely a click without having to do anything mm -hmm. it the email system may actually click on that link for you and auto unsubscribe you if there's no landing page that asks you to to confirm that is really interesting <laughs> yeah so that's something to to be careful of and so that's where probably yeah having a, a a form that they have to check a box and then submit would would be the way to go oh definitely no that's super interesting yeah so run into that before okay next one um, question of 
So I figured, uh, Camille, this might be up your alley calendar. You're the calendar lady. <laughs> Don't know how that happened, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Scheduling hundreds of people to different time slots. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a fun job. Um, is it doable in Airtable? What, what would you, what would you say? Uh, you need an app probably, <laughs> or, a uh, fairly you know robust script. Apps? Not really. Um, so <laughs> that was your chance to plug. Well, what I've what I've done allows you to say um, if Jim has all of these events that he's already signed up for, you can sign Jim up for another event that doesn't overlap. But if you're trying to say I need to schedule Jim and Nancy at the same time, it doesn't really help unless you want them combined into one record. Um, I think what this person might be asking for, there is a script in, um, I want to say the, the marketplace or it's somewhere on the community forums. It's called shift, shift scheduler. Um, I think, um, and I think it lets you select what times generally people are available and then filling in those times with people. Um, I haven't used it. I'm not entirely sure if that's what they were requesting or if that's what they need, but it sounds like you probably could use that script as a starting point. Um, but I see in their question, they're asking for stacker or softer and the answer there, I'm going to say almost definitely is no. Um, you're better off using like Calendly and then using API or Integromat to sync things together. Um, software and Stacker are great for displaying data, but uh, and Stacker more so than Software is good at editing data. But when you're trying to do something as complex as don't let me schedule for any time that's already taken or show me in relation to everyone else and then let me schedule, at that point, just use Calendly or some other similar service. Yeah. And this problem, even a lot of the standard scheduling platforms don't solve this one. This one's more of a, a you know, human resource type platform where you're mm -hmm. scheduling jobs and, and workers. So in that case, you're probably, you might have to get a little bit more custom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the other tricky part is because I've thought about this as well. Like I've I haven't been super satisfied with scheduling software, but getting it to sync with your Google Calendar or, or Outlook or whatever you're using for for your calendar. Now you can if you're using Google, you can sync those calendar events back into Airtable, which would which would help in some of it. But the actual scheduling to make sure that there isn't conflicts at that time that part's tricky. Yeah, I'm in, I'm seeing in my mind's eye an app someone could make of if you have a table of people and then a column that's like linked to their Google calendar, like their public Google calendar URL, if they have that so they could show when events take place it is possible using the system that I use for both scheduler and master calendar, the most recent version of full calendar, which is open source, um, allows you to import events from Google Calendar to be displayed, which means the data model, I'm starting to get technical, but the data model allows you to reference both events pulled from Airtable if you're building a custom app um, and events being pulled from Google Calendar and then using its internal logic to not let you overlap there. The reason why Master Calendar and Scheduler don't make use of that is because it requires Webpack, which is not compatible with Airtable's current custom app uh, environment. So I'd love to include it as a feature. As soon as it's available, I will, but I am handicapped, if you will, um, in order to do that. You'd have to develop the platform separate from Airtable if you want to go the route that I just described. Yeah. Very good. So yeah, so that this one's a little bit trickier that, that would require some some custom 
implementation definitely not not out of the box but um yeah that that might be a tough one to solve with their table mm -hmm. okay here's one i brought up um so on reddit we're moving to reddit's community and um this one is from our friend chris dancy i actually got another one from him coming up but um this one he talks about he used a third party system and this isn't i didn't want to bring this up to to bash on on the third party but he definitely talks about the the bigger concern that he brings up in this is be careful with your data and who you're giving access to your data this one is a financial um system that actually accesses your your bank account and then brings the data into your table and he's decided to to not use it and kind of talks through his reasonings for not but I think for us, you know, not so much specific to that product, but just in general, I think that is good advice. There are um, lots of apps coming into the marketplace and not always make known who the um, creator is. I saw somebody in our community asking about trying to get a hold of one of the creators of one of the apps that, that don't really make themselves publicly known. So if you're if you have anything sensitive in your Airtable data, just be aware of who you're giving your API keys to and giving access to that. Um, obviously, I'm biased of being an app creator and, and doing that. We we take our security as serious as possible of who has access to any data. We try to not store um, data on our servers when it when it's not needed and. Um, so just just definitely something to to be aware of with with your data who you're giving it access to yeah my 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 goal is to never need anyone's api key for anything uh we'll see how far that'll take me because there's only so much you can do with pure air table you know uh permissions uh it, from just what you're given as you know within the box of a custom app uh, but so far, you know, when I make an app, it's, I, I, I do not care about your data and it stays exactly where it should. The only thing that happens outside is you're either logging in to unlock the features, or if you don't want to unlock the features, I literally see nothing, like nothing. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to, to, to guard your API keys, especially for, uh, platforms like Airtable where you only have one API key. Um, other platforms let you create multiple different API keys and give them out to different services. Um, Airtable gives you one API key for your whole account. So just something to be, uh, you know, cognizant of. Yeah. And similarly, share links also falls into that. If you're mm -hmm. sharing your view or your base, um, you know, if you don't lock it, down with a password or something that's technically anybody who came across that that link could could get access to your data so you know good and bad of of um making your your data accessible so you just be aware of the the trade-offs there yeah all right continuing with chris um i just love every time he shares his his bases just how much effort he puts into making them visually appealing. So he talks on Twitter about um, some of the, the stuff that he's working on. So he's got some very visually appealing bases if you've seen any of his work. Um, and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but a little birdie told me that there might be a new conference coming down soon. So if you Chris's last one then and stay tuned for that. Cool. And uh, and he talks about, yeah, so here's his thread where he shares a bunch of his bases and what he's got going on. So it looks like he could use Master Calendar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I haven't tested. Um, it's I don't put a limit on the number of tables that you can pull in or number of feeds rather you could pull into master calendar. There's no hard limit in there. I have not tested bases as complex as uh, good old Chris Dancy's. Cause he has, he's famous for very, very complex and very well-designed, but very complex bases. So 
you know, I wonder, uh, could it even handle all of the feeds? I imagine he'd want to pull in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So anytime you see Chris sharing his stuff, it's it's worth checking out. All right, next one. This one I thought was interesting. Um, the question was, they have, they use a, a select dropdown and they have all of their lists. You can see this is a very long list that they've got. You could scroll down a long way. So they probably have a hundred or so different options and they want to be able to extract this list in some way and there is a way but it would require either it would require essentially um um using the 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 block the app environment to to extract those that list right, right. yeah yeah i think you could probably only do it with the scripting app yeah um, I think, yes, um, I was thinking in my head of what metadata is available in both scripting and custom apps and in scripting in both, actually, it's pretty easy, but you'll much faster in scripting. If you go table.field or table.get field and then get the field for the single select, um, there's options dot choices. Mm -hmm. And then you map the choices by just the name, because I don't think you would, this person probably doesn't need the ID or the color <laughs> associated for each of those choices. But then that will give you a comma separated list of all of them. It's a little annoying that that's the really only way to do it. There's not like a copy all or, or some kind of button within the configure field options. But yeah, it, it, cert it's certainly possible. Again, for until September, you need a pro after September, you'll need a pro account to use a scripting app. So at some point, this won't work for does, everybody. Does the scripting app expose those? Yes. Yeah. It does. Okay. Yes. I have, I have a script that I wrote to like turn them all into button choices. So it's mm -hmm. like kind of cool for like, uh, I mean, it could work for multi select too, but yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. That could be another, yeah, somebody should put a script up there to just generate a table of all those options and you could easily copy and paste them. Absolutely. That would be a pretty simple script to write. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll do that for a scripting. Actually, we'll, we can do that next week for a scripting time. I like it. All right, let's do it. Okay, Chris Messina, check us out next episode. We'll have your answer. All right, last one, then we'll move on. Just a quick reminder, this person um, used their affiliate link or their, their special invite link that everybody has if you go into your account and they just wrote one blog post, put the link at the bottom with their special one and they've already earned $470 in credits by sending people to Airtable who then signed up. And so a good reminder that, that you can get free credits that help um, pay your bills for your pro account. And if you have a large audience, use that and, and get people signed up for Airtable. It brings more into the community and you benefit from it as well. So I thought that was a good reminder to end on. Yep. If I'm not mistaken, for one person monthly, for a whole year, it's $240. So this yeah. person has roughly two years worth of Airtable for free for like one one blog post. So yeah. that's yeah. incredible. So very cool. Good job, Kareem. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. We're now going to take a minute and hear from me, the developer of On to Air, which is an all-in-one toolkit to run your business. Ontair is the primary sponsor of the Built on Air community. So with that, I'm going to share uh, something that, that is in our Amplify product. And we'll get kind of behind the scenes. You'll see how we run this podcast and what we're working on to improve our marketing efforts. And, and basically, we use Amplify to, as well as we use um, Ontair Actions to run um, the creation of creating blog posts, creating our YouTube videos um, that, that we're working on. And one of the features I wanted to showcase is um, this, this component here, this widget is a JSON editor. JSON is essentially a, a technical language, a way to format data that's very widely used, very easy to use. 
little bit more technical, but how we use this feature is, um, you know, Airtable, you think of everything is, is defined in a column. Well, sometimes you want data that's a bit more dynamic and you don't want to have to create fields for every dynamic element or attribute that might be associated with a record. A good use case for that is where you can use JSON. So JSON is a way to, inside of one long text field, you can put text in there that has uh, more attributes. And so what we do is for every different type of segment that we run within our Built On Air podcast, um, we have predefined elements or variables or attributes associated with each um, type of segment. So instead of having to create columns uh, or fields for each of these three, so these three are unique to the specific, um, this Ontario Spotlight ad that we're talking about here. And so instead of having to create all of these fields, some that are only used for one segment, others that are used for another segment, we instead have just one long text field. And inside that long text field, we enter these attributes. And so with a JSON field, it makes it easy to define these. I could add another one easily all through this UI. And then what happens is this is where our static segments are, are defined. And then when we have an actual live show, we automatically create a copy of this data. And then it goes into another view. So I'm gonna switch over to our live show segments um, and go over to this layout. And then now we use a copy of that data and this UI has this option called form. And what that means is you can't actually modify what's already defined in there. So it's almost like a mini form within a field. And so now for this um, segment, we just have to fill in the value for this predefined variable that, that we define just once when we create the different segment types. And so now I just have to um, enter in like who was the podcast host for this. And then we quickly go through each of the different segments and fill in the different variables using this form feature. So super powerful. Here's one that has three and we just fill in these and then these all get used in the creation of blog posts, our YouTube posts and everything like that. So it makes it very simple to enter just the information that, that's specific to you. So that's one of the features of, of the onto air Amplify product and then using JSON as a way to um, break down a long text field into, into sub elements. And then in particular, using this, this form layout within the JSON editor to not allow you to modify the, the key values and then only update the, the values on the right. So with that, we're now gonna move on to our next segment, audience question. And Camille is gonna take it. There you go, Camille. All right, is at, can people see my screen? Yes. Okay. So um, I saw this question on the community forums yesterday and I thought it was a pretty good question to answer. Um, essentially what they're asking for is if it's possible to use an automation um, that uh, you know changes the status of a record after somebody submits a form. And the answer is yes, it's true, but I realized you probably don't need an automation for this in the first place. So they have a series of products and um, people can either rent or buy the product. And what they wanted was after somebody submits a form that says that they've taken the product, they want the status of that individual product to say um, occupied or no longer available or something like that. And again, you absolutely could use an automation for this, but um, I, would recommend just using rollups or formulas. So to demonstrate, I just made a very, very simple base that has um, a list of assets or products, um, very, very simple with not much going on in it, and then a log table um, with a form attached. So you would select an asset from uh, the form, you would say who is being, uh, who is it going to, and then the date. Um, 
that somebody picked it. Um, and then you would click submit. And what happens then is, um, let's see, I have a roll up field that says whether or not something is available. Um, or rather, let me go to all assets because all of those are available there. Um, I have a roll up field that says whether or not something is available versus whether or not something is occupied. And what that is doing is it's trying to see out of all of the records from the table that had the form in it, how many of them have the date returned field that are empty. Um, if any one of those linked records doesn't have the date returned field entered, that means one of those records is still out, meaning that thing is occupied. So there's a little bit of logic to it um, and that's applied within this role of um, field. Uh, it's using a trick that I use all the time, which is to combine a formula with a roll up. Um, it's not advertised, but we've talked about it before that within the body of a roll up, um, roll up field, you can use regular formula functions. So I'm using an if statement in addition to the regular um, roll up aggregation formula of count all, um, combining those together to get if any of them are still out, then it's occupied. If all of them are in, then it's available. Um, and the benefit of using um, a form in this case is that you can limit people's selection to the assets table to only things that are coming from a particular view. And I have a view already set up that's filtered for only the ones um, that are available. So again, if I go back to that, uh, uh, view I was on, you'll see I do have a filter and just only showing where the status is available. No automations. Um, and um, I, I took a few guesses as to what um, this person's final uh, solution might look like. If it's something that, um, you know, uh, something isn't ever returned, it's just out and it's gone, then you don't need either of these two fields. What you would just do is um, have uh, this roll up field um, only count if, um, if the log field rather, or the link to the as la asset field is like empty. So if, if it has any links at all, then it's occupied. Um, but again, it's 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 flexible um, depending on what the actual final use case is. Yeah, that's very useful. Great use of not only the rollups but also the um, the ability to to use that that list within the form, which is a relatively new addition that Airtable made. Mm -hmm. So very cool, very useful, and. If you're okay, we'd love to share the space with the community, so. Yeah, I, this is a, a, a copy of a base that I test um, a lot of different apps with. Um, and it's so, so very simple. And I think it's a copy of a copy of the asset manager, asset something or other uh, base from Airtable's template gallery. So yeah, this is open to being shared. All right, thank you, Camille. Mm -hmm. with your uh, answer to that. Hopefully that helps our community answer that specific question. Now we're gonna move on to field focus with Ali. Share your screen, go for it. Awesome, all right. So this is really, really simple. Nothing like too crazy or fancy going on here. Um, I've been seeing a lot of people asking questions and I've asked this question myself. Of, many times, super confused, like trying to find, trying to perform some sort of formula function on a lookup field. Um, and I've since done, kind of changed everything to go with exactly what Camille just explained, like kind of combining a formula and lookup into just the one rollup. But there's also lots of situations where you might just want to have a lookup field. Um, and in this example, I have this lookup field that's just looking at the tasks table and just pulling over if any of the tasks are overdue onto the resources table. So we can quickly see like this person is two overdue tasks. Um, but say we wanted to just, instead of showing this whole big long string, 
say I wanted to like just show a warning, like a visual flag, if the word overdue is found in this uh, lookup field. And so the way that you would typically write that is, you know, you could write if find overdue in this field, then output this warning. But as you can see, there's nothing here, even though we've got the words overdue more than once in a couple of these records. And the reason for that is because this lookup field intrinsically, Airtable has it as an array. It is not a string. So you need to force Airtable to see this as just one big long string rather than separate values. And there's two ways to do this. One way that I'm partial to, just because I like wrapping things in functions, is you could use the array join function here and just wrap this lookup field in that value. And once I hit save, you can see now it's actually working. Um, another option would be to, instead of the array join, and I think that this is like a, a W Van Hall staple, um, if we just add an ampersand and two quotes, so just adding a blank, not even a, not even a character, just adding a, I don't even know what to call it. An empty string. Yeah. <laughs> An empty string, perfect, yes. Um, to the end of that field, that will also force Airtable to view this as a string rather than an array. So that will do the job as well. Um, and another way to do that by just using one field would be to change that into a roll up. I'll point it the same way that the lookup field is. And I would write if find overdue. And I mean, in this, this is kind of uh, maybe su superfluous just because there's not gonna be a warning here. We could just say if the values exist, then there's an overdue just because the only reason we'd have something there is if something's overdue, but I'm getting overcomplicated, neither here nor there. We could write if find overdue in the values that are returned then we want to have that visual flag. And that will do the same thing. So I don't even have to have these two fields. I can just accomplish the same thing with just one roll up. Nice. That's about it. All right, many ways to improve your efficiency working with uh, roll ups and, and those, those um fields there so thank you ali for that let's move on a quick plug for our community if you're listening to this and you're not a member of our built on built on air community you need to join now go to builtonair.com join and you'll get a weekly newsletter of everything that we're talking about here as well as other things that are happening in the community and you there's also a slack community that you should be a part of we want you in there and helping each other out so it's a great place to get access to other like-minded Airtable fans and learn from them and also we want to learn from you so join us at builtonair.com for a final segment we're gonna look at the automation process in this automate create segment and we're gonna go to um we're just gonna look at some of the new features that they've added. One of the new triggers, um, in addition to being able to change now your trigger type, which is really cool, is this at scheduled time. And they've made some recent uh, enhancements to this. So what this trigger does is it allows you to set up a schedule where this automation will run every time that this schedule um, the requirements are met. And so it's not triggered off of anything within your data. It's purely based off of the, the calendar time and date. So use cases for this would be if you wanted to send out a daily email at the end of the workday, uh, that, that would be a summary of everything inside of a view. That is a common use case for this. Um, if you know how to script and you're comfortable doing script, um, this is useful for things that maybe you don't want, you don't need uh, something to run every time a record is updated. 
um, but you want to process all of the things that have updated within the last hour, within the last day, you can set up this trigger and then perform a script that can do bulk operations of everything that is inside of a view um, instead of doing everything on a per record basis. So that actually saves some of your automation execution runs um, as well as it might just make more sense to, to update hourly instead of at, in real time when, when things update. So those are kind of some of the use cases for using this at scheduled time. So once you, once you pick that trigger type, then you will select how often you want this to run and it, you could either do minutes, hours, or weeks. And if you do, once you select one of those, then it gives you some more options. So you essentially for hours, you would pick every X number of hours that you want it to run. So if you want this to run every fifth out, every five hours, you do that. And then now this new feature that they added is you can actually set starting times of when in the future you want this um, to run. So maybe you want it, you, you don't want to run right now, you want it to run um, starting in a week or starting at something now. This is not driven dynamically, so there isn't a way to like pull a date from your, your Airtable data or anything. It is kind of hard coded, um, which is one of the limitations there. But that that is useful if you pick um, minutes. It's pretty much the same. Um, the, the most recent interval that you can have is every 15 minutes, so you can't run anything um, in a more in a smaller time frame than every 15 minutes. So something to consider. If you pick weeks, there's a little bit more functionality. So you can every you can say every two weeks, and you can pick pick specific days. And so maybe you want it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, every other week at this specific time, and then you can set it to start on a specific date. So a lot of variable configuration that that you can do to to run your automation and think about ways that things that you just want on a weekly or daily basis or hourly basis that would make sense to send out an email, um, process multiple records, anything like that. The, the schedule time is, is very useful for, for setting up um, automations on that front. So with that, that's the end of our Automate Create. Any final last minute words? No so I want to give a shout out to Hannah Wigginton uh, commented. I didn't get a chance to see that when, when um, you commented that, but we appreciate your, your feedback and your, your input. I will try to get that on next time. And next week, our show for next week, will actually uh, hopefully have a special guest with us, somebody, a, a creator that has built their business entirely on their table and is willing to open up and show how they run a multi-million dollar business entirely on on, um, on on Airtable. So that will be exciting. And Shay, good to have you with us. Welcome. Always good to have people watching us live. So join us next week. Until then, good luck with your Airtables. And, and we always love to see what you build on there. Talk to you next time. Thank you for joining today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to check out our sponsor, ontair.com, and we will see you next time on the Built On Air podcast. <laughs>